Okay, so in the book of Revelation, we've been uh, moving through trumpet blasts, and there are supposed to be seven trumpet blasts, and we've gotten through six of them, and we're expecting the seventh one, but in today's reading, we kind of encounter another aside. Similar thing happened when we were going through the scrolls just before this. Six scrolls were opened, and then there was kind of like an aside before the seventh seal. So what we encounter in chapter 10 of the book of Revelation is is a powerful angel coming down from heaven. And several things have been noted about this. First of all, it seems like a change of location for John. Because previous to this, he had been kind of caught up into the presence of the Lord in heaven. But now he appears to be back on earth because he sees this angel coming down from heaven. And this isn't an angel being cast, like this isn't a star falling from the sky kind of um, imagery. And it's been observed that this angel is unlike any other angel, at least in description. He was dressed in a cloud, and there was a rainbow over his head, and his face was like the sun, and his feet were like columns of fire. And he must have been awesome in appearance to be able to stand on the sea and stand on the land at the, at the same time. And he shouted with a voice like a lion. And as with every, just about every other word in this book, you know, it's been examined from every conceivable angle and there are various interpretations. Obviously, from a literal perspective, this is an angel. And then we described what this angel looked like. But a good many interpreters would say this imagery of a being with a face like the sun uh, coming in the clouds with the voice, the roar of a lion. This is, this is more than an angel. This is a divine being. And some would say for sure, this is, this is Jesus. While others would say this is the angel of God or God himself. So, you know, the cloud coming in the cloud voice of a lion rainbow, face like the sun, standing on the land and the sea. This is a picture of ultimate sovereignty, complete control, which is fascinating to think about because it's coming between trumpet blasts. It's coming between the sixth and the seventh trumpet blast that this happens where Jesus or, or a spectacular divine representative comes down in the midst of this showing complete dominance and control and authority and sovereignty. And when he speaks, the thunders respond. So it seems like kind of a big deal. And the seven thunders speak, and John was going to write down what they had to say, but then he was told not to, to to seal it up and not write it down, which has caused many uh, obviously, to wonder, okay, what was what was what was said? What what was it that wasn't written down? But I, I mean, it wasn't written down. Uh, John was told not to write it down. So I guess I guess at the end of the day, it wasn't written down. So we don't know for sure. And this has puzzled many a scholar. Some say that God was making a point that He was withholding. That he was demonstrating that he was sovereign and in complete control by not revealing all the future judgments. And so everyone not knowing all of the judgments forced those who believe to be more dependent, press in deeper. Others have drawn parallels with the Apostle Paul who claimed to be caught up into the third heaven and, 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 was, and heard things that he couldn't retell, that he couldn't write down. Others have speculated that that God had disclosed many things about the, the transformation of the apocalypse and the judgments and what would come from them, but he, he's unwilling to totally reveal his complete plans. They will be hidden from humanity until they happen, until the end of history. Others argue convincingly that this is a pause, that God isn't going to do whatever that will, whatever those things being spoken were, that he's relenting, that he's pulling back, which is true in many prophetic instances in the Bible. 
But the fact still remains that whatever was spoken that John was going to write down, he was told not to write down, so he didn't write it down, so we don't know what it was. Immediately after this exchange, the angel who's standing on the, uh, the sea and on the land raises his hand and swears an oath to heaven by the one who lives forever and ever, who created heaven and everything in it, the earth and everything in it, and the sea and everything in it. So the oath is being sworn in the name of the almighty sovereign God. And the, and the oath is, there will be no more delay. In the days when the seventh angel is ready to blow his trumpet, the mystery of God will be completed as he had made this good news known to his servants, the prophets. So, so whenever this seventh trumpet does blow, the mystery of God will be completed as God had spoken through the prophets. So in other words, the long overarching plan of God's redemption is completed as had been foretold by the prophets. And there's been plenty of conjecture on exactly what this mystery of God is, but most will land somewhere around the fact that this is God's, this, this is God's plan all along. This is his plan of redemption all along. And basically, Jesus' arrival signifies the beginning of the end, and the end is the beginning of the new world. So God's plan of redemption had been foretold all along through the scriptures. But the mystery of God's plan began when Jesus was revealed in his, in his first coming. And this idea comes from, uh, from Paul's letter to the Romans, from the 16th chapter of Romans, where it says, Now to him who is able to establish you according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested and by the scriptures of the prophets, according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to the nations. So that's pretty compelling evidence that the mystery of God spoken of here in the Revelation in the book of Revelation is exactly that. So the idea here is that the mystery of God is the way that he brought about redemption. He came in the flesh, and by human standards, by cultural standards, he was utterly defeated. So he came into the world, and he was light in the world, but the world didn't see the light, and instead tried to stamp the light out. And so Jesus was crucified and died in what looked like absolute, complete defeat. But the mystery is that this was God's plan. And Jesus was resurrected as the firstborn of essentially a new species, the family of God. And essentially that was the beginning of the end. And so as we read through the book of Revelation, then, the troubling things that are happening on earth are part of that plan. The hardships catalyze who is with God and who is, the, uh, who is against God, who is God's enemy. And as the enemies of God persecute the people of God, it could look like utter and complete defeat. It could look like the faith is being stamped out, like the light is being extinguished. God's enemies triumphing over God's people. But following along with the mystery of God's plan, as played out in the life of Jesus, you find your life by losing it. And so what looks like utter defeat and humiliation is actually complete and total victory. The next thing John is told to do is go and, and take this small scroll from the angel and eat it. And it will be sweet in his mouth, but bitter in his stomach. And that's exactly what happened. John eats the little book or scroll and it's sweet in his mouth and bitter in his stomach. And we end today's reading with John being instructed after he has eaten this that he must continue to speak what God has revealed. So a, a literal reading here, I guess, is theoretically possible. He could have somehow eaten a parchment that somehow tasted sweet to him but soured his stomach. But most think this is symbolic. 
Some would say that this is a commissioning or a recommissioning of John himself as a prophet. Like he's taking these words and putting putting them inside himself. And this is a symbol that he is being set aside or reset aside as a prophetic voice. And the reason for this is because the prophet Ezekiel was told to do something very similar. And that's pretty compelling. But what's also interesting is that John eats the words and they're sweet and then they become bitter in his stomach. So we have a bitter, sweet thing going on here. So on the one hand, John is experiencing sustenance and sweetness in the words of God, but what he has to prophesy is also difficult. So it's bittersweet. An another way of looking at this would be that the word of God, as it's ingested, is a sweet, sustaining thing. But when it goes inside of us, it... it disrupts it brings up all kinds of things that have to be dealt with and that could be what this imagery is representing others have looked at this imagery and concluded that the sweetness is a reference to the overall plan god's redemptive grace long suffering and kindness in his plan of salvation but the reality that exists throughout the entire new testament is that perseverance, endurance in the face of suffering is, is, is part of the story. Grace is experienced in, in, in hardship. So no matter how we look at this, we can say that the bitter and the sweet are intermingled and that John is instructed, in spite of the bitter and the sweet, to continue to speak what God has revealed. And that's where we end up in our reading from the book of Revelation today. So, Father, as we contemplate these things that we have uh, read from your word, not just from the book of Revelation, but also from the book of Zephaniah and the Psalms and the Proverbs, we invite your Holy Spirit to continue to churn and grow our faith. We see clearly in the scriptures our utter dependence on you for life itself, and we see the ways in which we turn to other things to sustain us. But we also see clearly that in the end, there is nothing but you. There is no other place to put our hope. And so we take this moment to turn our hearts toward our utter dependence on you and you alone. Come Holy Spirit, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.